Greetings, friends. This is Chris Batts, and you are listening to episode number 14 of the Future is Bright podcast. In today's episode, I spoke with Bill Ryan, SVP, Assistant General Counsel of AT&T Services, Inc. We discussed his family influences that led him to be an elementary school teacher in a bilingual classroom in Oakland, and then he became an attorney. We discussed his initial experience at Sullivan and Cromwell, then going in-house at DirecTV to be chief counsel for all their major content relationships, including NFL Sunday. We discussed how AT&T then acquired DirecTV and his now current role overseeing all legal matters for AT&T consumer with $100 billion in revenue, leading all legal operations and the 500 plus person legal team plus government and regulatory matters for AT&T and much more. Stay till the end to hear his internal wiring and perspectives on leadership, why he's passionate about DEI, and how he received a phone call in the middle of negotiations about his friend being held captive by ISIS in Syria, and so much more. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast and leave a review on iTunes and YouTube. A bit more about Bill. Bill Ryan is responsible for all legal support at AT AT&T's operations organization under Jeff McElfresh and for AT&T Latin America and global marketing organization led by Laura Lee, including support for AT&T Mexico, corporate communications and public relations. Bill also leads legal operations with the mission to support the ongoing transformation of the legal department. Prior to AT&T in 2006, Bill worked at Sullivan and Cromwell, where he focused on mergers and acquisitions, private equity transactions throughout the U.S. and Latin America. Prior to law school, Bill was a bilingual school teacher at the Oakland Unified School District. Bill served on the board of the James W. Foley Legacy Foundation, was the founding board member, board chair, for Valor Academy Charter School and volunteers for several nonprofit organizations. Bill is an alumnus of Teach for America and currently serves on the board of Teach for America Los Angeles. He received his bachelor's degree in foreign service from Georgetown University, graduated magna cum laude from Boston College Law School, and is fluent in Spanish. Welcome, Bill, to the Future is Bright podcast. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks, Chris. Uh, really excited to be here. Uh, really re- respect what you're doing with this podcast. Had a chance to listen to a couple of the episodes and really inspired by, by some of the people you've got to come on. Thank you. Well, and it's an honor to have you on the show. Um, I would love for you, you know, your, your story is inspiring and I know it's going to touch a lot of lives as you have a chance to share today. Um, let's start a little bit from the beginning. So let's talk about family culture and, um, what you were raised in and some of this uh, legacy with your grandfather, but also with your folks. Can you share about that? Sure. Um, You know, come from a a great family in Boston. Um, My, my mom was a school teacher and and my dad is, is a lawyer. Um, He's, he's getting up there in age, but still practicing and still going to court at a deposition earlier this week. And so um, it's, and his father as well. So my grandfather was a, a general counsel of First National Store after working in private practice. Okay. So growing growing up, um, the law was looked at with a, a lot of respect and opportunity. And then it also came with a lot of obligation. There's an incredible amount of pride and a sense of responsibility about the profession. And as we talk about my career journey, I, I tried to avoid it for a little bit. <laughs> but I... I, I <laughs> What you know, what had been embedded in me as a as a as a younger child eventually came back and, and has been really appealing to me. So, um, talk to me about where you went to school initially and that journey of what you studied and where you ended up going after uh, undergrad. It's, so, I, I went to college, uh, Georgetown University, through their School of Foreign Service, which focuses on. There are different options, but one of the focus areas is international relations, international government, international law. And I think that was a reflection at that time. And most of the college programs I was looking at really revolved around international relations. And there, there was an interest, even at that age, of a real desire to figure out um, where we sat in the world and better understand different types of people, different types of mm-hmm. cultures, different legal structures, different political systems, how people govern, how people led. 
And so this was an incredible opportunity. Uh, I was yeah. really, really fortunate to go on this program. Um, and so studied um, there for, for three to four years. And one of the years I studied at a uh, university in Madrid and uh, okay. University of Autonoma in Madrid and studied international relations while I was there just to supplement it, really had that That's experience awesome. in country of, of um, experiencing international relations and politics from a very different perspective. Yeah. It, um, so I know that you're fluent in Spanish. Was that through school or was it raised in your home or how did that language come to be for you? It, it, it was for, it was through school. I, I slowly picked it up. A really great program. When I lived in Spain, I lived with an older uh, Spanish couple. They didn't speak any okay. English. And I, I always joke. Right? I mean, I was 20 years old living in Spain and I would spend my Friday nights going to the local bar with my 80 year old Spanish parents. And we had a, I mean, nothing accelerates your Spanish than ordering beer and tapas and talking about with other, you know, octogenarian Spaniards. Like it was just such an awesome experience and culturally you're incented to learn the language. So that's when I really learned it. I've continued to speak yeah. it both professionally and personally since then, but that was probably the accelerant in learning it. That's awesome. Yeah. And th so going back to the program at Georgetown, I mean, there's some renown and um, amazing people have been through that program. So uh, was your thinking initially to go into in international relations and or be an ambassador or some sort of role within government? It, it, I had thought about that. You, you know, one of the professors <laughs> when I was there was Madeleine Albright. And I mean, it's amazing. You know, I, I don't even know if you fully appreciate, you think you do, and only probably with right. hindsight to really appreciate the privilege it was to hear and learn from someone of that stature. Um, I think the instinct was I knew I wanted to do something where I was constantly engaging with um, a diverse array of different types of people and different types of systems. And uh, I never knew exactly how it would net out but definitely a strong interest in um, continuing, continuously learning, especially on a multicultural basis. That, that I felt like was a great opportunity for my personal fulfillment. And that's evolved in different ways, but I think that was always the spark of just, I have more to learn. And they, again, Georgetown did an incredible job of just uh, growing and accelerating that, those instincts. So share with my audience that next step. What did you do after school? Well, it was a really interesting shift. Uh, there was some dynamics going on with the with the uh, Foreign Service at the time, and it caused me to consider other options. And again, you know, going back, my mom was a school teacher. Just as much as we value the professional law, I think we valued education. And at the time, it was still relatively new, but Teach for America was a program that was launching. And Teach for America places recent college graduates in under-resourced areas to teach. And so I decided to apply um, because I had done some tutoring, I had seen the impact my mom and other great teachers had had, and it felt it, it just felt like a, a really great opportunity to hopefully impact a, a community that was under resourced and also continue my professional and personal growth. And so I ended up applying, was accepted, and uh, was assigned to teach first grade in Oakland, California, in a bilingual okay. Spanish classroom. Oh wow! And how many years <laughs> did you do that? I did it for two years, um, and you know I, I, I joke about it, but it's it is not cliched to say that it's by far now this is some um, twenty five years ago plus the hardest job I've ever had, and um, <laughs> it, you, you know it, completely under resourced, unbelievable kids, unbelievable families, people really really looking uh, for the best education and feeling that intense pressure of that accountability as a teacher from day one of saying, you know, gosh, what a privileged position I am in to impact the lives of these students. I better do a darn good job of it. Yeah. And it was a real shift in maturation coming from college where you can be relatively selfish and successful. You can go right. home, study really hard, be successful. Success all of a sudden pivoted and is now defined as the success of everyone else around you. And, and that was a great growth moment for me and probably revealed some some growth opportunities I had. Um, I, I still call upon the learnings from those couple of years all the time. And I mean, Oakland has evolved quite a bit over 25 years, but I mean, back then that was a pretty rough place. It, it, it was, I mean, there were elements of that that were, Chris. I, I will tell you there were so many wonderful people though too, right? That yeah. were really 
um, working so hard to create um, opportunity and contribute to their communities. And there were so many great positive stories. There were some macroeconomic challenges for sure, yeah. but I have nothing but kind of bright light memories of these incredible people looking at the challenges as opportunities. Um, I, I, I always have to tell the story, Krista, when I talk about my time in, in Oakland, because going into that self-awareness growth, you think you have it all figured out when you're 22. And I used to, um, I, back in the time, I saw the pretty heavy Boston accent. It's thankfully okay. uh, evolved. But, um, you, you know, I would have the students write. Uh, so my students were mostly, you know, really fluent with very limited English, uh, but fluent, obviously, in Spanish. And the way we did it would start instruction in Spanish, build upon their native language, and then work to transition English. And so on Monday mornings, they would write a little bit of uh, a few sentences about what they did over that weekend. And I think I had 26 students. This was my first year teaching. And I came in on a Monday morning and I asked, you know, everyone write a few sentences about what you did over the weekend. They wrote a couple sentences and I got the papers in and I realized that I think it was say 23 or 24 of the 26 students had wrote, written the word, I went to a birthday party, P-A-T-Y. <laughs> you know, reflecting very honestly and accurately my Boston accent of saying the word. <laughs> so it was, it was a, a wake up moment. And I remember getting, you know, this is where you are you're getting in front of the class and, and, and forcefully saying, Hey, everybody, there's an R in potty. And they're looking at me like I'm crazy. Cause you know, especially in Spanish where the R is really strong and really dominant, they had no idea what I was talking about. So, I mean, it's just, it's stories like that, that just hold, so much uh, meaning to me personally. Um, a great, great group of kids, great opportunity for me to mature and grow as a person, a professional, as a leader. And again, i a uh, huge advocate for Teach for America and mm -hmm. so respectful of what our teachers in our country do on a day-to-day -day basis. So at what point through that process of teaching uh, where you're like, I need to go look at law school? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting intersection. I think there... There were a couple things. Uh, I had some I had some reasons to go back to Boston because of family. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I had ever, even though I had tried to convince myself, the idea of being a lawyer was gone. I think it was always in the back of my mind. But interestingly enough, there was a time that I think uh, there was a issue in California. It, it was called the UNS Initiative. And the UNS Initiative at the time was trying to change the pedagogical approach to teaching bilingual education. And effectively, it was trying to eradicate the use of Spanish and second languages in the classroom. Hmm. And I wasn't sure I agreed with the initiative. It was funded by a, a, Silicon, a very successful Silicon Valley businessman. And, you know, respectful of that opinion, I probably personally disagreed. I just wasn't sure I agreed with the process to effectuate changes in the classroom. I think it included provisions of personal liability by the teachers. Hmm. I didn't agree with the process. And I thought, you know, it's really hard to effectuate systematic change, as wrong as that may be, as a teacher. But if you could engage in the arena of law, maybe you could bring a different set of advocacy, a different set of a different set of eyes or perspectives. And I think that was the push that really eventually went to law school. I wrote my law school uh, law review article about that exact issue. That was okay. probably the impetus for push me back. Uh, I think that was probably the most significant uh, impetus, Chris. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so you ended up. Um, and forgive me, you landed at Boston College, so you went back to family, Boston College. Um, you did very well in law school. Um, and I know that you did some things during the summers. Did you summer at um, at school, or I'm sorry, at law firms, or where were you? Uh, doing? I did. Okay. Yeah, no, I did. It was a great, great law school, great classmates, really uh, appreciative that time. After my first year, I worked at the U.S. Attorney's Office, and I worked yeah. in the uh, drug division at the U.S. Attorney's Office. And, um, you know, great, great mentors, incredible lawyers, just incredible professionals, highly ethical, highly competent, um, just a, a really wonderful experience. And and they're very hands-on. I, I won't go into all the details of it, but very, very involved in very complex, high-stakes investigations. And... Yeah. So really a fascinating um, uh, a fascinating uh, few months and even got to use Spanish in certain instances and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So great mentorship. Um, 
I, I thought about the public service career, uh, but then um, some opportunities came up after my second year to apply with uh, Sullivan Cromwell. And I was fortunate enough to um, get accepted to go work at Sullivan and Cromwell. And so I did that after my second year. So very, very different. Um, but I, I, I was similarly intrigued after a couple of years more in the public space as a teacher. The private space was a very different area. And I felt like, just like I had learned from the public space, I felt like there was opportunity to learn in the private space. And so was uh, incented to, to, to try that out. So what was it like being at Sullivan Cromwell? What kind of clients and matters you handle? Um, I know they have a pretty intense work culture. Would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, I say to this day, just uh, I can't say enough about the quality of lawyering and quality of people. Um, yeah. Great mentorship, really intentional um, oversight. Uh, pretty quickly as I was there, I started in litigation, but, but pivoted and find this intersection I thought I was really interested in litigation, but as I got exposed to the corporate transactional side, um, going back now, you start kind of connecting dots and thinking through it, uh, international, Latin America, M&A, some IPO work, some regulatory work internationally, really kind of was consistent with the things I had been passionate about in college and learning about mm. new countries and new companies, the intersection of the legal systems. And so really quickly pivoted to the Latin America group um, in m a some securities work uh while i was at sullivan and cromwell uh in the new york office that eventually evolved into some work on the private equity side so both public and private m a work okay. um but i think the real passionate work when i first started was uh, latin america m a space yeah and were you able to use your language skills for that i, I was i mean it was uh, again you, i mean my my point of view on this is you can absolutely practice regardless of your language ability and people make it work. Yeah. I, I feel like it's, for me, it's, it's, it's really great to be able to connect people and at least make an effort to connect in, in the native language and yeah. build relationships on a different level and help understand the culture and things of that nature. So for me personally, that was a really significant element, a significant element of it. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so, uh, we had a fateful moment where you were in private practice at one of the top firms in the country. Um, how did this door open at uh, DirecTV? Um, it was a, a mutual. My friend, my wife is also a lawyer. Uh, she okay. practiced at uh, Gibson Dunn and then was fantastic a, firm yeah. administrator at USC Law and then a professor okay. at Southwestern Law. And she okay. had a contact uh, that had somebody at DirecTV and they were looking for a transactional lawyer. And um, the general counsel at the time at DirecTV was a guy by the name of Dan Fawcett, who, yeah. you know, I owe a lot of my career start to Dan. Dan unfortunately passed mm -hmm. away just very mm -hmm. recently. Um, but I remember interviewing for, for the opportunity and he said, um, you know, how can I have confidence? So the, the, the job that they were looking for was somebody to negotiate the media, the video content agreement. So the relationship with folks like the NFL and HBO and Disney, there was a multi-billion dollar budget at DirecTV. It was the lifeblood of it. And they had a good team and they were looking to add to that team. Wow. And so he came in and he said, you don't have a lot of experience in this space, but what I'm, you know, give me uh, your pitch as to why you'll be able to adapt and learn. And I had thankfully been able, I'd recently done a, a private equity deal that involved blood plasma storage and I drafted some agreements. and. He viewed that as good evidence that I could make it work. And I, I always I always respect that and remember that. Is it was a leap of faith in that moment. But assessing candidacy and qualifications with a little bit broader aperture of thinking, okay, how do you expand and pivot? Not necessarily do you have everything figured out at this moment for this next opportunity. So Dan was a, a really great thinker in the legal space. And so I, I made that pivot from uh, Sullivan and Cromwell to go to Direct TV. For, for me, I was sensing after a couple of years uh, or a few years at, in private practice that growing with a company and building the relationships with internally, again, were probably going to be more appealing to me than what for me felt a little bit that could be almost like a, a in all the best sense and respect to all my, my law firm uh, partners and friends, a little bit of a, a mercenary approach. You yeah. go and you give them everything and you move on to the next one. Yep. And that was hard for me. And obviously you maintain these relationships for a long time. 
I was at that moment in my career thinking, what does it feel like to grow with a business? And, yeah. you know, do, can I learn new things if I do that? And so, you know, probably an imperfect analysis at the time and simplistic, but that was, again, the reason I, I thought about a shift, ready to learn and grow with a specific company and, and experience that professionally. Did you ever think that um, you were going to be um, a key lawyer and working on these massive media deals um, at a very large company like this? Did you ever think that was part of your destiny or journey? <laughs> no, no. I mean, I, I, I always joke because, you know, it was only a few years before where we didn't have a nurse at our public school in, uh, <laughs> in Oakland. And um, there was a, a, a first aid kit. And so if somebody skinned their knee at recess, which happened, you can first grade happened Constantly. all the time. <laughs> you know, they had a, a box of plastic gloves and a first aid kit. And like the class, we, the whole class would start chanting and cheering, <laughs> put on plastic gloves and put a bandaid on. And, and it, you know, there were that, that was as professionally challenging and, and um, exhilarating as these moments, but it, it, it did take a while, Chris. It's, it's a thoughtful question because I, I think I still sometimes go back to that is that constant desire of like, man, there's so much to learn. I think even yeah. in those moments, um, I felt like very, very appreciative, uh, but very aware that career paths can go very dramatically differently uh, without much of, uh, without much change or intention, right? It's just very slight decisions end up in very different results. Um, when I absorbed it, I'll tell you, I, I think, you know, I'm really proud of the work we did there. It was a mm -hmm. dynamic time. The industry was growing. We had a wonderful relationship with partners like the NFL and and the other channels. And it was a real, you know, we're looking back, it's probably the golden age of the cable industry. And it was a fascinating time to be part of it. That's obviously evolved in a more challenged state. Um, but yeah, really, really appreciative of the relationships I built during that time. Do you have any explicit memories or anything that comes up, um, unique moments of negotiation or dynamics with the clients? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I there, there's all sorts of moments. I, I mean, I think um, personally, the the relationship with the NFL um, is is the one that really really stood out. I, I think that was a hallmark of the Directv yeah. product set at the time, um, and that relationship goes back uh, decades now. And so really trying to figure out how to make that mutually successful for the NFL to make sure that that product Sunday ticket is a good product and make it successful for DirecTV. That was kind of probably a hallmark of a, a real puzzle of how do you advocate, but also develop an evergreen relationship with a party that you want to be as successful as you are. And so that those discussions and some of the folks over there were just wonderful partners. And, and that's, that definitely stands out. Yeah. Um, so, but you were at DirecTV for almost, was it 10 years, nine years, I think? That's right. Yeah. And um, did you know or did you anticipate or would expect an, an AT&T to come by and um, acquire you? Um, was that something that was exciting or kind of a bit of trepidation with your future? How, how did you process that? Yeah. Yes. I mean, Chris, it's, um, I don't think you ever... In, uh, I think it's hard to internalize when you're, a, a, you know, DirecTV was a significant size company and yeah. acquisition wasn't top of mind. I think there were, indi there were indications that we probably had to be a little bit more strategic about our future, so not a total shock. But it was a fascinating development with my experience in M&A to now be the target of a, ma a major acquisition. And so I think as a lawyer, really – being able to be part of a transaction of that scale and significance and look at the advocacy and the negotiation and the vision that uh, AT&T committed to bring to DirecTV was also, was honestly just intellectually just so fascinating. And so I, I tried to enjoy the moment as much as I could, but sure. I, I mean, I have definitely a whole new level of understanding and respect for the cultural and people impact of acquisitions of that scale. They're, it's disruptive. And I, 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 I challenge anyone who says it's not, I, I would challenge anyone on that because I think it is incredibly disruptive to it, that period of not knowing exactly what the future will look like, no matter who the partner is. Yeah. You know, th this just kind of came to mind, Bill, but how do you build longevity and kind of more of a marathon mentality or capacity to care for oneself with all that you've done at uh, DirecTV 
and AT&T, I would think your life is constant sprinting from either fires or urgencies or quarterly matters. What advice would you say, or since you've been through some of this yourself that you could give to others, knowing the pressure that you've been under and others will be? Chris, I, I would say, first of all, that I am still working on it. And I think it's uh, being mindful of it's a journey we all need to get intentional about and being better. I, I would say I've had some wonderful leaders that I've worked for, wonderful coaches, I've actively sought out support. I ask that question to almost every single person I meet, regardless of their level, regardless of their job position. Yeah. So I think it's a fascinating question. And I think it's evolved. Um, I, Chris, first of all, I always try to make sure I'm contextualizing what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, my personal priority is, is my family all the time. Um, and so making sure that I've come to enjoy my job and look for elements of what do I find really satisfying personally and professionally and trying to integrate that into my work. Um, I, I think I, there's a, there's an exercise that someone gave me a really good mentor gave me this exercise and it's, it's always stuck with me. And, um, he, he he gave he asked, he gave me an exercise and he said create a list and ask your friends your coworkers and your family to write one word adjectives about you okay so get five friends five family members and five coworkers and he said come back to me once you've read you know aggregated that list so I did that exercise and I'm a very dutiful mentee. <laughs> so I went out and I got, I got the list and I was, I was really proud. I was really proud because it was like, you know, loving, kind from my family, like funny. And then my friends were like, good time, fun, loyal. And then work was intense, committed, deliberate, successful. And they, you know, the, the mentor at the time said, do you notice something? I said, yeah, it was all this great feedback. He's like, do you notice how different they are? Mm. And I'm not capturing it perfectly. And he said, you know, this idea of work-life divide, it's hard. Yeah. He's like, is there a way, are you bringing your authentic self to what you do every day? Because that's, <laughs> that's going to make it uh, sustainable. And that, you know, that was one of those aha moments in terms of a professional development. I'm always appreciative of that mentor because I realized that, what I did as a family person or as a friend, that's sustainable. But were those elements that I were, were manifesting or demonstrating those light, are there ways to bring that to work? Mm. And so I think that started a journey where I tried to pivot. Um, you know, how, I, I, value certain, I value certain types of interactions. I va value certain types of intellectual exercises. And the, the more I can bring that into my day-to-day -day job while do, trying to deliver for the business, supporting a large team, I found that that's, that's probably a sustainable model. Um, so being aware of um, being trying to be an authentic leader uh, is probably the most significant one. So Bill, um, knowing that DirecTV was acquired by AT&T, and I believe that was done in 2015, um, I'd love for you to share with my audience your responsibility um, as Assistant Attorney General at AT&T What's, what are you responsible for? I think there's quite a bit on your plate. Uh, give my audience a, some context there. Right, Chris. Um, so my current responsibility, it's, it's probably got four components. One is I, I, I get to lead a team that supports all of our at t operations. And so that's our broadband and our mobility and our enterprise and small business and mid-sized business, uh, our network build. Um, so you know the scale is is just it's incredible and a testament to the success the company has it's tens of millions of customers and tens of billions of dollars um so it's 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 a complex regulated structure um with a really great team that that handles the hard stuff day to day i also then provide uh support to our at t mexico um uh, asset and it's a it's a really fun. I was just down in Mexico last week meeting with the leadership team. We have a wonderful general counsel down there, a wonderful oh. CEO, and they're much more in a challenger state. Uh, it's a really complex regulatory political environment. They're doing an exceptional job. Uh, wonderful team. Very, very different. Obviously, a very similar product set. But in terms of the legal issues, uh, in the, the regulatory structure, it, it's 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 rather distinct. I support our uh, 
our GMO team, our global marketing organization team, which includes our corporate communications and other elements. And then I help run our legal operations for the department. We have a 400 person plus department and uh, as you noted, a, a significant legal budget. And so it's really trying to help our leadership team be thoughtful in the allocation of that budget and our people in a way that makes people's careers feel fulfilling and, and we're creating the right opportunities for, for the organization and then most significantly supporting the business. Uh, so it's a fascinating area, but it is, it's, it's, it's a really great array of responsibilities and I'm appreciative of, of the role. How many direct reports do you have right now? Would you say? I have five direct reports and kind of indirect. It's, it's a couple hundred people. So, Bill, it's uh, giving context again to the legal department, the legal team, the hundreds of folks that are inside of this, the budget of how large it is. It really creates um, you guys in a different orbit than most of corporate America. Um, there's probably a handful that can maybe come even close. Um, can you explain to my audience um, maybe some of the evolution of that or kind of your heart and approach to it, um, being that you're head of legal ops there? I Chris, it has evolved significantly, and, and I, I think it is. It's a it's a it's an awesome journey. We have a wonderful general counsel, David McAtee, has really established a great vision for the department, and it's you know it's it's great to be part of the leadership team that's helped trying to deliver and execute on that vision. And it has been a journey in efficiency, and just you know, AT and T has talked publicly repeatedly about its focus on costs and being more uh, simple and really assessing our cost structure. And just like the rest of the company, we have joined in that journey. And so it is not a simple process, but I think we've come up with some really significant principles. Um, you know, we're really focusing, making sure our folks are, are prioritizing appropriately. What are the most significant items we can focus on for the business? Um, and, then, and then I think we've tried to achieve some things with, uh, the mantra that, that our department runs by and that David McAtee has set forward is this idea is two is one and that we do everything in close coordination as a department. And, and that culture has been pervasive and driven both impact but also efficiency. Um, so it, it is a significant size uh, department, Chris. I think it's evolved significantly over, it has evolved significantly since 2016 and it's a, it is a smaller department, a more efficient, but I, I would argue maybe even a more impactful department because we've set out the right cultural vision in terms of let's focus on the most significant matters and let's really build a, a esprit de corps amongst the legal department and communicate. And that's helped us deliver on both what the business needs and what we need to do from a cost perspective. Bill, when you think about uh, your leadership journey and what was one moment that had a significant impact on you um, would love for you to share this particular story that's on your heart. Uh, sh sure. Um, Chris, it was, it was the summer of 2014 and it was shortly before the, it was in the months before the AT&T acquisition was announced. And we were actually negotiating some significant content agreements at the time, including the NFL Sunday ticket agreement. And, it, it was in that area where, um, you know, work feels and the intensity of that advocacy, as all lawyers know, can be overwhelming and feel like one of the most significant things you've ever experienced. And you put an incredible amount of energy and even emotion into those engagements. And this was no different. This was a very, very intense negotiation. And it happened that uh, it was you know, in the midst of one of those negotiations that I re re received the, the really tragic news, um, the heartbreaking news that my friend uh, Jim Foley had been uh, killed in Syria by ISIS in a really public, horrible way. Um, I think for a lot of people, the image of Jim in an orange jumpsuit is seared. And, and it was incredibly uh, it was incredibly personally impactful. Uh, I mean, I was actually in the middle of a negotiation when I found out the news, um, and my counterparty uh, knows how grateful I am of their reaction to kind of help me process the moment. Um, I can say it with some lightness now, Chris, because mm. that moment in so much tragedy has borne so much goodness. 
And that's the way Jim would want it. That is truly the way he would want it. Um, I always make the recommendation. There's a wonderful documentary. It's called Jim. And it tells the story of Jim's captivity and the spirit he brought to that captivity. And that's the perfect representation of that. Um, I, I think, you know, it'd be too cliche to say, hey, it, it caused me to take a moment to contextualize or personalize. I will just tell you that you probably never think about work or your role uh, quite the same way when something like that occurs. Yeah. And I think it's made me work harder at being a, a, a thoughtful and I hope empathetic leader um, and never really fully understanding what everyone's going through at any given moment. Yeah. There are un unfortunately um, stories of, of tragedy and challenge all the time. And yeah. so I, I, I think I took a lot of learning from that. Um, I will tell you, uh, Chris, We've turned out, his family's turned that into a wonderful foundation. I, I support them. I do some legal work for them. I am exceptionally proud of the impact it made in journalist safety and advocacy for uh, hostages, U.S. Uh, hostages abroad. Um, you can look it up, James Foley Foundation. But that, that moment, Chris, will always stick out as a very pivotal moment. Um, and I've made the commitment that I will take nothing but good and hopefully make a positive impact from that moment. Um, and, and have it not just affect the foundation and what I can do for Jim's family and his legacy, but for my own leadership journey uh, and in, in my professional and personal life. Thank you for sharing, Bill. That's very personal, but also just, just a powerful story for folks to, to know your connection to that and how you've given and how it continues to impact you and others. So thank Good. you. Good. I'm happy to, I'm happy to always happy to talk about Jim and his legacy. And, um, again, highly recommend the, the Sundance award-winning documentary. <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful tribute to, to his legacy. Pivoting a little bit, but in, in context to, uh, speaking of contextualized things that are important to you. Um, I know you have a huge heart for diversity and inclusion, uh, with your journey. Um, can you share a little bit about your family life? Give some context to it. Sure, I, I do, and I, I always I always joke that you know my commitment to diversity is nothing more than my commitment to my family, right. and I'm really exceptionally proud of my family, and I, I am exceptionally self aware of a lot of the privilege I've experienced. Um, but I, you know, my my wife uh, was born in Mexico, came to the United States at a very young age, um, and and sharing her professional journey. And the challenges that she encountered that I've never had to encounter is it's it's impossible for that not to be instructive. And then both my children happen to be adopted from Korea. And that was a choice my wife and I made a long time ago. And it's, you know, people who've gone through the journey of adoption, I think, would relate that it's the most natural. Of, of course, this was always the way it was meant to be. I, I, I have, you know, the story of diversity I always share with my family, which is... <laughs> insightful into some of the challenges you have as a, as a busy leader. My, my son was at a young, as a son at a young age, and, and my son's name is Danny uh, Ryan. And um, someone asked me the question of, you know, are you being really intentional about his, his, his um, cultural education? And, and listen, I'm super proud of the efforts we make on this. You know, my, my children are learning Korean, we're mindful of it. But at the time, my son was pretty young, and I, I, I have to be honest, we were just trying to keep things afloat. And I remember, I remember feeling very obligated to prove to everyone, mostly myself, that we had figured this out in my, my typical haste. So I, I, I went to my son, I said, Danny, I said, hey, we gotta, we gotta talk about something. You know, all the five years old looks at me, has no idea what's coming. I said, Danny, what, what, you know, where, where's mom from? And he says, Mexico. I was like, great, perfect. I said, Danny, where are you from? And he said, Korea. Great. Dan Danny's very, and his, and his sister Liliana are very aware of their life journeys. That's awesome. And I go, where's dad from? And he goes, work. <laughs> <laughs> I said, all right, we're probably, uh, we got we to make some other life adjustments <laughs> um, to make, make sure that, you know, I'm prioritizing everything and allocating everything the right way. Um, Chris, I, I, I am not, I, I am not the expert in D&I. &I. I have a, a deep commitment to be the best ally I can be. And I will tell you, I'm still figuring out how that looks and, and, and manifests itself in my responsibility as a leader. Um, 
but I, I, I'm open to learning and being mindful of that. And I think that's what I try to bring is being mindful of the obligations that I have as a leader and as an ally and someone who's benefited from a lot of privileges that not everyone has and making sure we're being exceptionally thoughtful. And again, coming from a place where I just want my kids someday to have all the opportunities that I had. Um, yeah. So th that's, I defer to some experts. You, you've had uh, some great guests speak about it. Um, but yes, it's, it's, it's a deep personal passion for sure. Bill, how can people find you, contact you, follow you on social media? Um, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn and uh, it's William Ryan at at and and I, I make the offer all the time. I, I've been the beneficiary of so many great relationships in this industry. People like Dan Fawcett, people like Mark Rolig, um, <laughs> who, who you, you know well, Chris. Um, people just take the time and, and have given me incredible advice and feedback. Uh, to help my career journey and my offer is open. I, I mean, I feel like I have that duty and privilege to give insights into what may be helpful as people think about their career journey and their, their leadership. Bill, it's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you for your time today. Thanks, Chris. Really enjoyed it. Thank you.